Hi friends, great to be with you tonight. And uh, I'll tell you what, I am going to grab my power cord so my computer doesn't go to sleep. So just hang with me for a second. Go ahead and sign in. Let me know that you're here and uh, say your name and then where you're coming from. So join me and I am going to, uh, let's see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab my computer cable. I'll be right back. Hang tight for just a second. I'm just getting my computer plugged in so I don't lose power. All right. Okay, good to be with you tonight. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, let's do something here. Uh, let me see if I can get you down just a little lower. <laughs> Sorry about this. All right, that's better. Thank you so much for uh, hanging out with me. Hold on. Getting this a little close. There we go. That's exactly what I was looking for. All right, I'm sitting on my back porch in uh, Stillwell, Kansas, and uh, what a beautiful night. It's a little windy out, but uh, hopefully that wind noise won't bother you too much. I'm just enjoying getting to sit outside and uh, share Vespers tonight. My name is Adam Hamilton. I'm the senior pastor at the United Methodist Church of the Resurrection in the Kansas City area. Uh, I am also the author of a few books, and I am the host of Tuesday Night Vespers. And uh, For those of you who are here for the very first time, I love this because I always feel like I'm sitting here on my back porch and there are, well, right now there's 158, uh, 165 people, at least uh, eyes on this. It's probably some, you know, couples who are doing this too, maybe two or 300 people so far. And usually by the end of the week, there's a couple thousand people who've been, uh, who've joined me. So I, I just feel like you're all sitting here. I've got several empty seats, one, two, three, four, five, six empty seats out here. And I feel like uh, you're all sitting here with me. So I'm glad to have you joining me tonight. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about what's coming up at General Conference. We've talked about this some before, but I, maybe I'll share with you a few things that I've not shared Maybe it'll be boring for you. Maybe it'll be interesting for you. And I'm going to make a recommendation on, a, on my favorite study Bible, too. So we're going to do all of that this evening. But I'd like to begin with a word of prayer, if you would bow with me. God, as we gather for this Vespers, this conversation about faith and life and the church and, and um, your will for us as humans, we thank you. As I sit here on my back porch, I can hear the birds singing and the wind blowing. It reminds me of the power of your Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost when, like a rushing mighty wind, you filled the, the upper room and all those who were gathered there. And I pray that you would fill us tonight with your Holy Spirit. Everybody who's listening, joining me tonight on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or whenever they're watching, I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would lead and guide us, that you would uh, drive us wherever you will to do your will, and that you would renew us and strengthen us, fill us and forgive us, and we offer ourselves in this evening and this conversation to you. Thanks for everything. Thanks for all these people who are joining me tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. And once more, if you're just tuning in, go ahead and uh, say where you're coming from. I think people enjoy going through and reading and, and watching. I can't really watch the names coming across now, but I, uh, I mean, I see some of them. I see Linda and I see Stephanie uh, Matthews Hashigan and Dave Ackerman. Hey, Dave, good to have you joining tonight. And, uh, and some others. So I see those coming across the screen, but I can't watch that while it's going. So I look at it later on. So go ahead and sign in. Let me know where you're coming from. And other people uh, often will uh, see you and maybe know you and, and uh, chime in as well. Hey, I thought I'd start with a recommendation for a Bible. Somebody asked me today on Facebook, I think it was Facebook or Twitter, uh, what my recommendation is for a study Bible. Or, or they actually asked, what uh, Bible does uh, do most of resurrection people have? I think we probably have a whole bunch of different Bibles. I've got probably 50 different Bibles in, uh, in my office and, uh, and a number of them here at home. Uh, so this is, uh, in terms of translations, my, I think my favorite modern translation today, uh, with a few exceptions, is the CEB uh, translation, the Common English Bible, and this is the CEB Study Bible. And uh, this is the Bible we give to new members when they join and they fill out a commitment card. It's just a small way for us to say thank you for turning in your pledge card, which is a 
part of what we ask of every member. And uh, part of what I love is it's got great introductory uh, comments about each book. So like this is the book of Ecclesiastes and you can see it's got, whoops, let me do that. It's got a great introduction. It's got some good graphics. And so it tells you a little bit about the book and, and why it was written and where it gives you an outline of the book, which is right there. And then as you read it, um, on the bottom of each page, you're going to find all kinds of copious notes about what you're reading above. And I think these are really excellent notes. Then they've got some great maps in the back of the Bible and, and, um, uh, yeah, some excellent. In fact, I think some of the best bat maps, and it's got a concordance in the back. And so I find this, and I think there's some opening essays in the very front of it. I think this is uh, maybe the finest uh, study Bible that's out there today, and I have a lot of fine study Bibles. Um, the NIV study Bible is, an, is a good study Bible. It tends to be from a little more conservative uh, theological vantage point, but it's, you know, those are great notes, and, and I appreciate it. I enjoy the New International Version translation of the Bible. Uh, it is uh, probably one of the most readable, uh, and it's in my head because that's when I started reading the Bible was the NIV, and so a lot of the passages, I hear them that way. Um, the NRSV, New Revised Standard Version as a translation, is, uh, is probably the one that I most hear in my head because I've studied it for the longest period of time. Before the CEB came out about 10 years ago, the NRSV had been what I'd memorized in Scripture, what I'd preached from every week. So when I'm putting scriptures in my sermons, I go back and forth between sometimes the NIV, sometimes the NRSV, sometimes the CEB. Generally, it's going to be the CEB, but I always look to see which one is the easiest to comprehend when people are listening, which one feels like it captures uh, you know, something as, they, as people hear it that will really connect with them. But, uh, and this is like a small version of the CEB that I carry with me. It's just very tiny. It almost fits in a pocket. It'll fit in my suit coat pocket on the sides. Um, and uh, I can still read it. So it's even though the print's small, I can still read it. This has no notes, no study notes in it, but it's nice to have a small version of the entire Bible with me. And then as uh, oh, I took it out, but as most of you know, I carry a pocket New Testament in my back pocket. And uh, for me, that's the NIV or the CEB. I've got both uh, that I'll carry around with me, uh, one or the other of them. And then, of course, I've got Bibles, all kinds of translations on my, on my phone, my computer, and my, uh, my iPad. And I use Olive Tree Bible software. Um, on that software, you can purchase. It comes with a number of different older public domain um, books and commentaries, but then you can purchase commentaries. And anymore, most of the commentaries that I buy, I buy on Olive Tree because then on my iPad, I've got, I've got like 10 commentaries, and I can be reading and studying multiple commentaries. And when I'm traveling, I don't have to carry big, heavy books with me wherever I'm going. So anyway, that's just some uh, tips on scripture and which scriptures you might find, uh, which translations and study Bibles you might find uh, most helpful. All right. I also want to say to those of you who joined the church last Sunday, we had, I'm not certain the number. I think we had two, maybe 200 people join the church at all of our locations, but uh, at Leewood, I, I think it was hundred and, I don't know, 120 people. And it was such a joy to listen to people's stories and to hear them. So I stand at the door as they walk out. I can only talk to each person for about two minutes, not even that, sometimes just 60 seconds because there's people waiting in line. But just to hear briefly people's stories and people talking about, you know, I turned away from God or the church or a friend brought me and all of a sudden for the first time Christianity made sense or, you know, I'm one of those people who has lots of questions and doubts, but, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm, you know, I'm taking a step in the right direction and I'm, I mean, it's just really, really cool. And Sunday, I baptized at the 11 o'clock service, and you may be joining me right now, but one of our uh, newer members, he just joined in December, and we allow people to go ahead and join, but then to get, be baptized as soon as possible thereafter if they have never been baptized. We don't rebaptize; We can renew people's baptism, but uh, this man, I think he was 81 or maybe 83, baptized at the 11 o'clock service and had never been baptized in his life and just came to faith really in the last couple of years, started coming to help a friend uh, who wanted him to be at church, and then... Uh, and then along the way, he came to believe and professed his faith in Christ in December and was baptized Sunday. And it was just cool. I'll just tell you, this is part of what makes uh, it what's, it's what gets me up in the mornings. And it's why I love what I get to do 34 years after I started resurrection. And, you know, gosh, 36, 38 years after I was ordained, I still love this job. And there's a lot of parts of it I love, but one of those parts is, uh, is seeing people's lives transform, seeing people come to faith in Christ. And uh, so, anyway. Okay, so I, I wanted to uh, share with you today uh, a little bit about um, what's coming up at General Conference. And as you know, so next Monday, uh, a week from yesterday, I, I and a group of others from our congregation, there's five of us that are delegates to General Conference, 
are going to be flying to Charlotte, North Carolina. Some might be going out Sunday night, some might be going out Tuesday. It officially begins on Tuesday, but I've got some meetings on Monday night. And we'll be meeting every day. I think it's something like 7.30 in the morning until uh, 6.30 at night. And some nights we'll run over that. Uh, we'll meet Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We have Sunday off. And then we start again Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And it ends on the following Saturday. So we're gone for however long that is. It's, uh, gosh, yeah, anyway, it's, it's, it's like 11 or 12 days. And, uh, and we'll be meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina. And so I thought I'd just tell you a little bit, just to remind you of how the United Methodist Church's polity works. Polity is how we're organized, how we're structured. And in our polity, uh, we are organized around a series of conferences. And this conference is meant to be, a, uh, it, it gathers as a uh, entity to uh, pray with one another, to seek God's will, to encourage one another, and to make important critical decisions in the life of the church. And so the smallest unit of that is the charge conference or the church conference. So that's the local church. And at least once a year, and often at Resurrection, we have multiple church conferences every year. We meet, everybody's invited, anybody can come. You have to be a member to have voice and vote. And, uh, and at those meetings, at the local church level, annually we approve the budget of the church, we approve the senior pastor's salary, um, we approve, so you see, if you're a member of Resurrection, you see, here's my salary package, there it is, you can, uh, you can talk about it, debate it, I always leave the room, and then you come back and, and uh, vote on it. I mean, I, I come back after you voted on it. Uh, we also approve uh, officers in the church, so all of our leadership is, is approved by vote, and then, um, and then we also approve candidates for ordained ministry. And this is fun because every person has to be approved by a church conference to start the journey towards ordained ministry. And then after approval at the local church level, they're passed on to the district and then to the annual conference. We'll talk more about those in a minute. So this last Sunday, it was kind of fun. Gary Anderson joined the church. He was in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Axby, Bixby, Oklahoma. And that was my first um, job in, in the United Methodist Church. I, I was the youth pastor at Bixby, my senior year in college at Oral Roberts. And, and Gary, I believe, was on my staff parish committee, and they were the ones who, who recommended me to the church conference at Bixby to be an approved candidate for a ministry. I was 21 years old, I think, when they made that recommendation. And so it was fun. His church, Bixby United Methodist Church, left the denomination, became, I think maybe they're part of the Global Methodist Church. Maybe they're just uh, not, maybe they're non-denominational now. Um, but when they left, Gary and his wife knew we, we want to remain United Methodist. They started worshiping with us online, and they drove up from Tulsa to Coffee with the Pastors to join this last Sunday. Anyway, uh, so, so the church conference recommends people for ministry. And it also is where you vote on buildings. So if you're going to do a building campaign, uh, if you're going to acquire land, there's a number of things like that you've got to approve at church conference. So, uh, so those church conferences, usually there's one a year. But then if you're presenting new candidates for ministry, you'll have several more. We have a lot of people we've approved for candidacy and ministry. It's very exciting. And uh, we'll have a church conference coming up again uh, in the not too distant future to approve more candidates for ministry. So that's at the local church level. level. It's called the Charge Conference. A local church is called a Charge. Uh, something that the pastor is charged with shepherding and caring for. And, uh, and so it's a charge or a church conference. Then from there you have a district. So Church of the Resurrection's Leewood location and its Kansas locations are a part of the Kansas City District on the Kansas side of the state line. And there's about, I, I'm making this up, but I think there's 70 churches in that district. And so you can have a district conference. It doesn't happen very often, but once in a while they'll gather together all the pastors and a lay person for each a pastor from the district and they might, might make a recommendation for the district to do something. Again, those are rare, but that can happen. Then you go from the district to the annual conference. The annual conference meets annually. It meets once a year and it's the conference. Uh, it is the gathering of every clergy person in a particular geographic region and a lay person to go along with every uh, clergy person. So our annual conference by and large is the Great Plains Annual Conference. That's Kansas and Nebraska. And there's about 800 churches, maybe 850 churches in Kansas and Nebraska. Three of our locations, we have six locations, three are on the Missouri side. And so they're, they come under the umbrella of Church of the Resurrection, but they're also affiliated with the Missouri Annual Conference with about 650 local churches. So the Great Plains Annual Conference, we meet for four or five days, usually four days in June. And there we vote on the budget for the annual conference. We hear reports. We vote on ministry initiatives for our annual conference. We ordain clergy. The people who are recommended by the local church are ordained after they've gone through seminary and they've, uh, or licensing school, or uh, actually they're ordained after 
uh, the course of study and uh, or seminary and then uh, they're ordained and then at the, the last thing that happens at annual conference so we worship together we pray together we you know vote on things the last thing that happens at annual conference is the bishop reads the names it's called fixing the appointments and reads the names of where every pastor is going to be assigned now resurrection has 30 clergy uh, lay, uh, elders and deacons and so we have 30 lay people who also are there so about 60 people at annual conference there's a total at annual conference I'm thinking of about 1,500 people um, who are delegates to annual conference, or they're actually technically called members of the annual conference. And so um, uh, so that meets once a year, and um, so that's the annual conference. Then there's the jurisdictional conference. So each one of these are taking you know a step above. Jurisdictional conference, I'm going to show you. And hang with me. If all this sounds really boring to you, we're going to get to some more interesting stuff in a few minutes. Let's see. Oh, we got 470 people. Hey, Kimmy, uh, good to see you there. Charles, good to see you. Glad you're joining. Lindsay, nice to see you. Um, so this is a map of the United States. And what you see is each of those different colors is a jurisdiction. So you see the purple is the South Central jurisdiction. And you can see Kansas and Nebraska at the top of that. The Great Plains Annual Conference is, uh, is part of the South Central jurisdiction. We come all the way. Well, I can't do it backwards. But anyway, we've come all the way down to Texas. And you can see each of these others is a region. You'll see the big blue section, the whole western half of the United States is the Western jurisdiction, and that's where we have the least number of churches and, uh, and have struggled a bit with churches, although there's some really wonderful and vibrant churches there, but uh, that's where we have the least number. And um, so that gives you a sense of the jurisdictions. There's five jurisdictions in the United States. They meet for a jurisdictional conference, the delegates that are, so at the annual conference, they elect delegates to jurisdictional and general conference. Again, don't worry about trying to remember all this. But uh, we have, I can't remember, something like 30 delegates from, uh, from Great Plains that go to the jurisdictional conference. At jurisdictional conference meeting once every four years, we meet for two or three days. And the most important job at jurisdictional conference is to elect bishops. So when a bishop retires, uh, then you elect a new bishop to take their place. And we elect bishops from the South Central jurisdiction. Anybody who's a clergy person can be nominated, but typically every annual conference will nominate somebody from their annual conference. And uh, so we vote on who are going to be our next bishops. That happens at jurisdictional conference. Then again, once every four years, the same year that jurisdictional conference meets. So jurisdictional conference this year will meet in July in Arkansas. Um, but every the same time jurisdiction, the same year jurisdictional conference meets, general conference meets. General conference is made up. This year we have 862 delegates uh, from around the world. Again, you are elected. So the same people go in jurisdictional conference. Half of those are full delegates to general conference. The other uh, are reserve delegates. Doesn't, I'm not being completely accurate on that, but that's sort of how it works in Great Plains. So we have 862 voting delegates, half of them laity, half of them clergy. They come from all around the world. Uh, oh, by the way, in other parts of the world, they don't have jurisdictional conference. They're called central conferences, function in much the same way. So at general conference, this conference is going to meet in Charlotte once, again, once every four years, but ours hasn't a full regular general conference hasn't met till since 2016. We were to meet in 2020 and COVID happened. And each year it was postponed until now. Uh, there, these books are issued to every, every delegate. And these books, I have five of them, I think, four or five. They have 1,099 valid petitions that were submitted. So these are things that an annual conference or a clergy person or a lay person submitted to the general conference as potential legislation, new rules, new procedures, new things that... Uh, you know, uh, changes to our book of discipline, uh, 1,099. Now, we break those down into subcommittees, and so my subcommittee has, I don't know, 100, not even that many, 70 or 80, and many of them are easily, they're, they're things that, you know, they, they can be lumped together. They're kind of saying similar things. And then ultimately, the subcommittees meet the first week. They debate, you know, the, what they have, and they debate on, well, will we take this to the whole session of the general conference where it'll be debated again and then approved or voted down? There'll be 18 worship services during general conference. The delegates, this is interesting, and I'm pulling all of this from a document from the United Methodist Church. You can find this online. Um, but there are 133 annual conferences represented. So there are 54 in the United States and 79, I guess, around the world, something like that. 55.9% uh, of the delegates are from the U.S., 32% from Africa, 6% from the Philippines, 4.6% from Europe. I want you to remember that because this year will be the last year that the largest number of delegates will come from the United States. Because 25% of our churches in the U.S. departed, we will be losing delegates at General Conference, and Africa continues to grow, and they'll be gaining delegates at General Conference. And so probably the next time around, 
you know, it, it certainly will not be that the U.S. has a majority of votes. Um, there'll be 26 plenary sessions at General Conference. Can you imagine that? I mean, it's exhausting, literally, it's exhausting. Uh, 14 legislative committees, I've mentioned that, 10 languages that will be spoken with interpreters for all of those, and many of those interpreters are coming from Kansas and Nebraska. Seven special addresses and celebrations, four official written languages, English, French, uh, Kiswahili, and uh, Portuguese. And so that's just a little bit about, and the other delegates, 59.9% U.S., 32% Africa, I maybe mentioned 6% Philippines, 4.6% from Europe. Uh, so... That's a little bit about what's happening at General Conference. I thought you might find that uh, somewhat interesting and helpful, as uh, especially those of you who follow me. Next Tuesday <coughs> at 7.30, my aim is to come to you live from General Conference. So you'll see me set up uh, in the uh, probably in the conference room. It'll be, hopefully this last session will be finished for the day, and I will be having a chance to speak to you from there. Wednesday night, I'm gonna be speaking in Charlotte to anybody who wants to come from you know, North Carolina or wherever, and any of the delegates who want to come, I'll be speaking on my book, um, Wrestling Without Finding Faith, the same presentation I gave last week in Atlanta uh, on uh, in the evening, uh, and I also shared in Ohio and in Dallas. I'll be sharing in Charlotte next week after the session is over for the day. Uh, we have special evening meals, too. Uh, there are certain, certain things that happen in the evenings at meals as well. Okay, so that's general conference. So in some ways, because our rule book captures both our beliefs our book of discipline captures our beliefs and our policies and our procedures. A lot of what's happening at, at uh, General Conference is tweaking our book of discipline. Now I'm going to see just, I, I think a healthy organization probably doesn't spend two weeks trying to tweak its rule book. Uh, I would love to see us in the future be focusing on where's the mission, where, where are we going, what are we going to be doing and not arguing over our rule book. But I want to tell you a little bit about how we got to arguing about our rule book. First, I want to do a little show and tell with you if you'd let me do this. So I'm going to hold these up. These are some of the older books of discipline that I have. Let me pull this back here. Some of the older books of discipline that I have. Some of these came from Ray Firestone. If you are a part of Resurrection and have been for a long time, uh, you'll know Ray Firestone. He was a retired pastor who joined us when we began, and he died some years ago. And uh, some of these came from him. Some I received from other pastors. Some I purchased along the way or picked up along the way. Uh, and you know when I at garage sales or whatever if I saw them at, at rummage sales I'd pick them up so I'll just tell you a little bit about these it's kind of cool actually to see these let me see if I can turn you know, you won't be able to see them I'll just I'll pick them up and hold them so again this is just show and tell this book of discipline leather bound and you can see it's just it's just in really not in great shape uh, this one was published <clears throat> in New York in 1808 it's called doctrines and discipline of the Methodist Episcopal Church and uh, the Methodist Episcopal Church was the Methodist Church in the United States, 1808. So, and you know, part of this is doctrines, and part of it is the sort of the rules that we live by. And uh, and I want you to remember the Methodist Church in the United States <clears throat> officially started with our organizing conference in 1784. Now, they've been Methodists around long before that, but they were a part. They remained a part of the Anglican Church or the Church of England, and uh, until the Civil War, at which time uh, they. They became, you know, we became kind of our own movement. 1784, it was made official. So this book is, uh, what I tell you, it was uh, 18, or sorry, 1808. So this is 24 years <clears throat> after the founding, <clears throat> excuse me, after the founding of the United Methodist, well, of the Methodist Episcopal Church as we were known then. So there was the Episcopal Church, those were the Anglicans. We were the Methodist Episcopalians. Uh, and that was, a, that was something different. And we became our own denomination in America. In Great Britain, they remained a, a movement within the Church of England. So there it is. Uh, this is uh, from 1806. And I'll just kind of quickly walk through these because I, I do think it's kind of fun. Look at this little tiny one here. This one came from, let me see here, from 1872. So we've skipped way ahead. Um, what is that? 60, uh, 64 years ahead. To 1872. I would love, if I had a lot of time, I would have looked up the history of what was going on at each one of these times. But you can see the book got a little bit bigger, but not much. Uh, this is from 1888, so from 1880, 1872 to 1888, 16 years ahead. And you know, during this period of time, I mean, this is when Reconstruction is going on in the United States after the Civil War. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot happening in our world when these general conferences were meeting. Uh, this is 1906. Uh, I've got, uh, this one is 1912, I think. Let me just see here real quick. 
not that you care that much, but I just, oh, it's 1916. So 1916. Uh, this one is 1920. All right, so, uh, so, you know, we're talking about the following after the, uh, the First World War. Uh, 1939, this was a really important one. In 1939, so it, starting, actually, I need to go back a bit, but uh, 1844, I think, the Methodist Episcopal Church split in America over slavery. And in the South, uh, they favored the ability to continue to have slaves. And in the North, they were opposed to slavery. I'm oversimplifying, but... Um, but the church divided over slavery in 1844, I think it was. They didn't come back together, so they became the ME Church South, the Methodist Episcopal Church South, and the ME Church, Methodist, Methodist Episcopal Church North. And in Kansas City, we were right on the dividing line, so we had ME Church North and ME Church South in the same city, sometimes just blocks away. That's why in the greater Kansas City area, to this day, we still have 100 United Methodist churches in within the 30-mile radius of downtown because there were both denominations that were starting them. Plus, there were EUB churches, or at that time, uh, Evangelical and United Brethren churches, and Methodist Protestant churches. They were all, uh, you know, ultimately would become one denomination. 1939, so this book of discipline. In 1939, uh, the General Conference met in Kansas City, and for worship, they met at Grand Avenue Temple downtown, which is where Resurrection Downtown started. And I think they must have met in, I don't know if the, I think Municipal Auditorium was there. That might have been where they had their meetings. And, uh, and in 1939, the Methodist Episcopal Church North, the Methodist Episcopal Church South, and the Methodist Protestant Church came together, reunited, and became the Methodist Church. So this is the first book of discipline of the Methodist Church. That's what it says in the front. Discipline of the Methodist Church. It didn't say any North, any South, or Methodist Protestant Church. And they worked to, to come up with the rules that they would have, you know, for this new united, uh, comp, you know, uh, denomination. And the you know parts of this, they've got uh, their historical statement, Declaration of Union, the Constitution, the Church membership, you know all of these things are uh, are in here as well as uh, you know how the how the church is organized, and boundaries and worship and ritual and so anyway, um, that is the 1939 Book of Discipline, uh, and then I've got this one here. This is the year that I was born, 1964, and so 1964. This is the last. Book of Discipline of the Methodist Church before it became the United Methodist Church. So it's gotten a little thicker by this time. And by this time, there were already conversations going on to unite the Methodist Church with the Evangelical United Brethren Church. These e, the Evangelical Church and the United Brethren Church had come together. And now they were all going to come together as the United Methodist Church. So that takes me to this Book of Discipline. This is 1968. This is, and you'll see it doesn't even have the cross and flame on it yet because that logo was still being worked on. At least I assume that's why it wasn't on there. So this is the, this is the Book of Discipline of the United Methodist Church, 1968. This is the founding Book of Discipline for the United Methodist Church. So, and it's got, you know, it's got all the same sections that we have today. There's, you know, but there's stuff that's been added to it since that period of time. And, uh, and so this is the beginning, the, the founding Book of Discipline of the United Methodist Church. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. This is the Book of Discipline from 1972. You'll see it has the cross and flame on it. And this is the Book of Discipline that set us on a trajectory of fighting for 52 years. It set us on a trajectory of fighting over human sexuality, over homosexuality is the term used in the Book of Discipline, because prior to 1972, there was no, as, as far as I recall, there was no statements about homosexuality before 1972. So just to give you, again, a sense, none of these books of discipline say anything about homosexuality. It just wasn't something that was talked about. It wasn't that wasn't known, but it wasn't talked about um, at this period of time. And the organizing book of discipline of the United Methodist Church does not mention homosexuality. So 1972 in Dallas, or excuse me, 1968 was in, uh, was in Dallas. 1972 was, I think, in Atlanta, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, in Atlanta, at the General Conference, and let me just give you a little bit of background as to what's going on at the time. So you've got, in the late 60s, sexual, uh, you know, mores are changing, or mores are cha mores changing. You've got, uh, you know, what sometimes is called the sexual revolution. You've got, you know, radical changes in our society and what's going on. And, uh, and in the midst of that, you know, you've got the church is, on the one hand, some are trying to rethink, okay, what does it mean to be the church today? And are there things we do need to rethink when it comes to sexuality and, uh, and human relationships? And, in, uh, and then there are others who are 
you know, who are like, whoa, wait a minute, we can, we got to be serious about holding the line on on morality, and and uh, and so the Methodist Church has always been made up of liberals and conservatives. Let me pull this over, and so you've got both of these coming together, and they manage to do the dance pretty well most of the time, and uh, but they're a general conference, and uh, again, this is you know now there's conversations about homosexuality. It's not that they were going on before, but now things have been brought to the general conference in the, in the form of petitions, you know, that show up in books like this today, and. So a little bit more background, 1969, I think it was, was the Stonewall Riots. This was after the uh, police in uh, Greenwich Village had uh, raided a the Stonewall Inn, I think it was called, or the Stonewall Bar, I can't remember what it was, the name of it was, but it was a gay bar. And the gay and lesbian community, typically, there were places where they could come and feel safe as they gathered. So uh, the police raided, and uh, as near as I can tell, I've read multiple accounts, but at some point, uh, the forcefully, uh, physically, um, you know, hitting or accosting and arresting and dragging people out, gay and lesbian people who were there just to be with each other and hang out, right? As near as I as as I've read all of this, this is I was only four, so. Um, and in response to that, the gay and lesbian community rose up, and said, "We're tired of being harassed, and it's not fair for you to treat us this way, and we're we're not going to take it anymore," and so. So there became a series of public uh, outcries about this. And there were other people who were saying, it's not fair that you treat people this way. And, and, uh, and in 1970, I think it was a year later, so that was in June of 69, June 70, uh, was the first gay pride parade. And, uh, and from here, you know, a, a very public movement of a sort of a call for civil rights for gay and lesbian people. And so the church is trying to, you know, the church is always trying to ask, what does it mean to be the church today? How, how, do, we, how do we care for and love people? And you see, the church had always had gay and lesbian people in the church. Every church you've ever belonged to, whether you're conservative or liberal, whether you thought it was a conservative church, it could have been a Baptist church or an Assembly of God church, you had gay and lesbian people in your church. And uh, unless it was just a tiny little church, maybe you didn't, but generally speaking, you had gay and lesbian people. Sometimes you had gay and lesbian people who worked for you. Sometimes they were even pastors, but you didn't know it because they were in the closet. And, uh, and you just assumed they were, you know, forever single, or maybe they were living with their, you know, their friend, or they were sisters of a sort or whatever you had, you know, but people, it wasn't like you didn't have gay and lesbian people in the church already. They were, uh, they worshiped, they were in Sunday school, they sang in the choir, they were sometimes pastors or music directors, <clears throat> or, you know, they were in, involved in the church, but it was not talked about, right? It was quiet. And, uh, and so you come to 1972 general conference and during 1971 an increasing number of people and just to remind you in most states in 1972 it was illegal to be gay or lesbian and to act upon it so it was still illegal to be engaged in a same-sex relationship uh, there were sodomy laws that that could end up with people in prison this was true in many countries around the world but it was true in almost every state in the united states and um and so you know and, and so there was, if you got divorced and it was discovered that you were gay or lesbian, your children would be taken away from you. There was just a lot of things that were, you know, unjust and not right. And, and so uh, at that 1972 general conference, uh, the general con there was a petition that was put forward. I'm going to read to you what it said. And uh, so this was the language that was proposed to be added to the Book of Discipline. We reject all sexual expressions which damage or destroy the humanity which God has given us as a birthright. So I want you to catch that. So anything that's dehumanizing, anything that causes harm to people, that would be abusing children or having any, any sexual relations with children. That would be any kind of sexual assault. That would be, I mean, a whole range of things that would destroy the humanity God has given us as a birthright. And we affirm only the sexual expression which enhances that same humanity. So I, I would interpret that as anything that reflects agape, or true love. Uh, true love is an action. True love is in humanizing people, as in ministering them, blessing them. In the midst of diverse opinions as to what constitutes that enhancement. So it says, you know, we, we're, we don't all agree on what that enhancement looks like, but we do think that, that in the end, whatever is, is, a, is uh, appropriate sexuality is going to enhance our humanity, not to degrade it. And then it says, and this was the line that... Uh, that then kicked off some other things. Homosexuals, no less than heterosexuals, are persons of sacred worth. Now, there may have been another denomination that said that before this, I don't know, but that was a pretty radical statement to say, 
that our children who are gay and lesbian and our uncle and our siblings and our and the people in our communities who are feeling beat up or made to feel dehumanized we're not going to say that instead we're going to say that everybody is of sacred worth including homosexuals no less than heterosexuals are people people of sacred worth <clears throat> who need the ministry and support of the church in their struggles for human fulfillment as well as the spiritual and emotional support of a fellowship which enables reconciling relationships with God with others and with self further we insist that homosexuals are entitled to have their human and civil rights insured that was, that was 1972 so that statement generally speaking many at the, at the general conference said okay I, th I think I might agree with that and there were some who said, I absolutely do agree with that, and we should be saying this. And what they were trying to do in everything was the church was trying to say, how do we, how do we live the gospel today, 1,972 years after Jesus was born? What does it look like in this world to be the church, to be the presence and, and body of Christ? Now, as you can imagine, there were other people who heard this, and they were really upset about it. And, and they were like, wait a minute, what? Okay, uh, yeah, I'll, they're okay, people are of sacred worth. The ministry, they need the ministry of the church. Um, but it sounds like without saying anything to the contrary, it sounds like you're saying being gay is okay. <clears throat> and these were people who, you know, were raised as I was, as many, many of you were. They were raised to say, well, we don't want to beat up on gay people, but we don't think it's right. We don't think this is God's will. And they could point to a handful of scriptures in the Bible, six scriptures in the Bible that, depending on how you interpret them, most of them sound pretty blatantly that same-sex relationships are wrong. And so, uh, so in the middle of all that, and it was at a time too, in the midst of the sexual revolution, where there were a lot of people who were having free love and people were, you know, they were willing to sleep with other people's spouses while they were married. And so there's a lot of stuff that's going on at this time. And, and they said, wait, wait, we gotta, we gotta also say, and so this is where the hand goes up and somebody gets to a microphone and they says, okay, I can accept some of this. Let's take out two or three of these lines but I can accept that homosexuals uh, are people of sacred worth. I can accept that they should have the support of the fellowship or have the care of, a, of the church. Um, but we also need to add, but the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. And if we say that, then I can support this other, as long as you're crystal clear that, that, that the practice, that actually being in an intimate relationship with somebody of the same sex is incompatible with Christian teaching. Now, as you can imagine, Suddenly, you've got a general conference where, you know, one group was trying to lead forward in, in, in trying to be positive about gay and lesbian people and say, we want to welcome you and care for you. And another group was saying, hey, but wait a minute, we're in the middle of the sexual revolution. And it sounds like you're just saying everything's okay and, and that it's okay for people to be in same-sex relationships. So the progressives were very unhappy with what the traditionalists wanted to add. And the traditionalists were unhappy with what the progressives wanted to add. And they, and they fin finally sort of came to a... Well, nobody was quite happy with what was voted on, but they did manage to approve it. And I don't know if, what the percentage was, maybe 60%, maybe it was more than that, who approved it. And I don't think they had any clue, because I, uh, I was reading something today that was describing, you know, the, somebody was there and describing what, what they felt. And it was like, okay, so now we're done with that. Now we go on to the next thing. And they had no idea that by agreeing to something by a 60-40 or 62-38 or... 54, 46, I don't know what it was, but they just agreed to something that was going to set our denomination on a trajectory of 52 years of conflict over this that would suck the oxygen out of the room, that would be the, that would leave people feeling hurt and wounded by their church, that would, um, so anyway, that was, uh, that was this book of discipline. Now, what we did in the years since is the progressives then would try to go back and want to change that and try to find some way to say, can we just say that we don't all agree about this? Would that be, can we just say that? I mean, I, I made that petition in one of the general conferences. Other people did the same thing at other general conferences. And uh, no, we can't, we can't say that we don't all agree, that we're not all of one mind. The conservatives had enough votes, or the traditionals have had enough votes. You just needed 51%. They had enough votes, especially as Americans were changing and more American delegates would have wanted to change it. There was an increasing number of delegates coming from Africa. And they, along with the conservative bloc, made up enough to make sure that that was never going to get changed. And, um, and so every four years, we had this painful conversation again. I've shared with you before here, 
I watched bishops get arrested. I watched people with tape over their mouths and laying on the ground, you know, who said, we have no voice here. I, I grabbed a woman by her leg as she tried to jump off the balcony, and, and I think that was Cleveland, and uh, I and a couple other people. And so, you know, that's, that's where we've been living. So it wasn't that, then we didn't stop there though. So that just said the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. But then every four years, uh, we, in the midst of the debate about it, the traditionalists would add something else, not every four years, but often, uh, to clarify the position because the progressives were sometimes violating, you know, what the discipline said uh, because they believed it was immoral and unjust. And so uh, they added to this, um, let's see, additional prohibitions included pastors cannot officiate at weddings of same gender people. And this became a chargeable offense so that you could be defrocked if you officiated at the wedding of a same-sex couple. There was a pastor in Nebraska who officiated, I think it was at his son's wedding, and, uh, and was, you know, defra uh, left the ministry, was forced to leave the ministry for that reason. That, that happened with hundreds of pastors across the country. Uh, churches cannot be used for such ceremonies. So even if the pastor didn't do it, the churches cannot be used for such ceremonies. No United Methodist property was to be used for same, same gender relation, uh, marriages. Uh, Self-avowed practice, these were all things that were added over the years since then. Self-avowed practicing homosexuals cannot be ordained. Uh, no denominational funds can be used to support anything that appears to support the acceptance of the practice of homosexuality. That could be, uh, you know, no funds being used by any of our general boards or agencies that would be a for, so, for a support group of gay and lesbian people or their parents or anything else. It was no funds can be used for this. So, you know, it just felt like it just kept getting more and more onerous, at least if you were on the progressive side of things. And in the meantime, there were a lot of people. So when I joined the United Methodist Church, I would have been on the more traditional side. And over time in ministry with people and studying scripture and, and you know, recognizing its complexity, you know, my own views began to change. So probably 30 years ago when we started the church, we were always, I was always compassionate for gay and lesbian people and would never beat up on them and told them this was a safe place and I would stand up for them. But I still held a more traditional view. And it was probably about six or seven years into doing ministry with people and studying scripture and, and it's, it's complicated, you know, it's complications in places or complexity that my own views began to change on that. So that happened with a whole lot of people in America, including, you know, I was evangelical. There was included a lot of evangelicals whose views began to change, even evangelical seminary professors. He, you know, a whole lot of people whose thinking began to change on this over time. And that's still happening in our country and in the United Methodist Church. So anyway, in 2019, we had a special general conference, called general conference. In 2016, I was one of several people who asked the bishops to please lead us, to please do your work as bishops and come back to us with a proposal that can maybe hold the church together, but at the same time recognize that this is not working. It's not functioning when half of the church, really more than half of the American church, holds a view different than, you know, more than half of the general conference delegates. We're it's painful, please help us, please lead us as bishops. So they agreed to do that, and then they formed a commission that met for three years. And in 2019, we had a special call general conference, some of you will remember, in, uh, how am I doing? I'm about out of time, um, in St. Louis. And in St. Louis, um, the bishops brought forward a proposal called, uh, I don't know if it's called the Way Forward, or what the, what the, I can't remember the name of the proposal, but some of you will remember. But and what they suggested was basically doing what I've been suggesting as well and others have been suggesting, remove the language from the Book of Discipline that says that the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching, all the prohibitive words, remove those. Let the Book of Discipline be agnostic. Let pastors marry who they're gonna marry based upon their theological and biblical understanding and convictions. Uh, conservative pastors don't have to do gay weddings. It, didn't, it wouldn't make gay weddings a, a requirement. It just wouldn't talk about them. So. Those who are traditional, be traditional. Those who are progressive, be progressive. And boards of ordaining ministry decide who they're going to ordain as long as they meet the other criteria for ordination. And that was voted down. And uh, it was voted down. So what the bishops re recommended was voted down. And, uh, and instead, even more restrictions and prohibitions and punishments were added to the discipline as it was. So you can imagine if there was more than half the U.S. delegates wanted to see a change, but you add you know, international delegates, and there was enough with the conservatives to, to win the day. But it wasn't just that we stopped at, let's just leave it the way it is. We started adding more prohibitions there. So if you officiated a same-sex wedding, this is in 2019, for a first offense, a minister must face a minimum penalty of a one-year suspension without pay. 
And then if there were any subsequent offenses, they would be permanently removed from ministry. Uh, it was the duty of bishops to refuse to ordain or commission clergy candidates, even if the Board of Order Ministry certified them or credentialed them. The bishop would be in trouble if they ordained them, um, if they were openly gay uh, persons, if they were married, a gay married person. Um, the discipline then required, uh, the, the 2019 discipline then required that bishops, that district and conference boards of ordained ministry would have to, it says, conduct a full examination and a thorough inquiry into every ministry candidate's compliance with our standards uh, and forbidding them from recommending anybody who didn't meet those uh, requirements. And so, again, now we're going to do a whole lot of questioning about people's sexuality to make sure that we know that they uh, meet the criteria. Then it went beyond that. Uh, it now required that uh, before any individual and the boards of running ministry are half lay and half clergy, before they could be appointed to a board of running ministry, by the bishop, so the bishop makes those final appointments, uh, they could not be appointed unless the bishop certified that they only nominated to the board people who had uphold their ordination standards. So in other words, no progressives on the boards of ordaining ministry unless they agreed to abide by the traditional understanding. And um, and so in, in essence, it in some ways just, I mean, it just, anyway, you get the idea. Uh, so here's what's being proposed for 2024. This is the last printed book of discipline, the 2016, even though things were added in 2019. So what we're trying to do is when it comes to what homosexuality, what it says about homosexuality, negative prohibitions, incompatibility, all that, we're trying to take the book of discipline here and, and take the portions, basically in essence, we're taking the book of discipline and its negative prohibitions, putting them right back, to where we were in 1968, and all of these other Book of Disciplines that said nothing about homosexuality. So our Book of Discipline will say, it will keep the, you know, everybody's of sacred worth, and everybody should have the ministry of the church, but our Book of Discipline from 1784 to 1971 didn't say anything about these prohibitions, and that's, in essence, what we're hoping for. So in Africa and other parts of the world that are more conservative, pastors who are more conservative, keep being more conservative. Nobody's saying you can't. Nobody's saying you have to officiate at same-sex weddings. Nobody's. We're simply saying that pastors officiate at weddings according to their conviction. And in the central conferences, they can add something back into the Book of Discipline that says, in our conference, you can't do this. In many conferences, in Africa in particular, it's illegal to officiate at same-sex weddings. And so, anyway, that's, that is the big news from General Conference, hopefully, is we're going to pull out the language that was added from 1972 to 2019 that was many consider harmful or was, and others consider faithful, but uh, the language is gonna come out and we're gonna live with the discipline the way it was for almost 200 years. All right, uh, I wanna say, uh, I know I'm running over, but I wanna say that when it comes to sexuality, we're kinda messed up as a society and as a world when it comes to sexuality. So this is not saying we have no morals. We have, the Bible doesn't shape our morals or our values when it comes to sexuality. Uh, I will say that my expectation is that gay and lesbian people who are followers of Jesus Christ are going to strive for holiness just like straight people are going to strive for holiness. That means we're not going to take advantage of people. That means we're not going to assault people. It means we're not going not to have a misuse of power or a power differential that, that's uh, unjust. It means that we're not going to harm children. It means we're going to do no harm with our sexuality. It means that sexuality is meant to be practiced within the context of agape and love. And ideally, at least when it comes to intercourse, within the context of a, a marriage, within the context of marriage vows, which sounds so old-fashioned to most people today uh, who say, you mean we can't have sex before we get married? Well, as a pastor, I'm saying, I don't think that's God's ideal will. I think God's ideal will is the night you get married, you are sharing your, your, sharing your body, your whole self with another person, and you're consecrating that marriage uh, in, in terms of the act of physical intimacy, of, of sexual intercourse. Now, so I'm going to lift up that high standard for gay people and straight people at the same time, and to say that we're not to, meant to cheat on our spouses. So in the 1960s free love generation, we kind of see this today in places. That's just not what God's intention is. It hurts people. That's not agape. Uh, I'm going to say sexual, uh, you know, pornography is, uh, though huge numbers of people participate in pornography, we're going to continue to say that's not God's best and ideal will because it, it leads us to slavery and to uh, sometimes confused sexuality and, and dysfunction. 
And so we're going to continue to say, you know, there's, a, there's an ideal way that God intends for us to use the gift of sexuality. And it's a good and beautiful gift. And we're also going to say, I'm going to say as a pastor, I recognize that there's a whole lot of people who have struggled with their sexuality. Uh, every man that I know has. I, don't, I can't put myself in the head of a woman, but I can just tell you for every guy, somewhere along the way, you struggle with lust, you struggle with desire, you struggle with doing things that you don't intend to do and you shouldn't have done and you find yourself feeling guilty and bad and ashamed. And that's just a part of life. We are human beings. And this is why there's tons of grace, right? We're not, you know, it's like, okay, so we don't always live into God's ideal will and we should. And, and there's this, God has a reason for this ideal will. But when it comes to, homosexuality, part of what we're saying is, at least I'm saying, not everybody would say this, is that there are gay and lesbian people, they are gay and lesbian, they are wired this way, like I'm wired as a heterosexual. And in Genesis chapter 2, it says it's not good that the man would be alone, he would have, God would make a partner as his companion, and the woman was his partner. And there are people for whom, you know, who are wired, it's what, 5 or 10% of the population, uh, who whose companion, the person that they are drawn to and long to be with, is somebody of the same gender. And I just have to believe if we as humans can understand that, God fully understands that too. And so what I'm meaning is by this, for me, not for somebody who's on the more traditional side of this, but for me, I'm kind of left of center on this just a bit. And, and that would be to say, I think God wants people, so I think if it was one of my daughters, both my daughters are straight, but if one of my daughters was a lesbian and this was, this was her identity, it was her who she was from the time she was little that she's early as she could remember for me personally I would look at her and I would want her to have a companion and someone to share her life with I would want her to be married and to be able to to share the joy that Levon and I have in a relationship and I think if I feel that way it's possible that God might also be big enough to be able to say big enough is not the right word gracious kind loving understanding enough to say that that's okay for that person that's not saying that sexual immorality and do whatever you want. No, there's rules. There's, there's ways of living that are holy, that look like loving your neighbor, all of that. So anyway, that's me. That's not everybody. So for me, I'm saying if, you're, if you see the scripture on the more conservative side of that, I get that because I did for a long time. And I want you in the United Methodist Church and be who you are and minister with love and kindness and compassion but you, you can say, you know, for me, I'm not comfortable there, but I still love you and I still care about you. And for me, I'm going to say, you know, okay, I, I really believe that you are seeking to follow Christ and living in a life of love together. And I want you to be able to share that blessing in marriage. So we're in different places. And, and that's kind of who the United Methodist Church is going to be going forward. We still have lots and lots of traditionalists or conservatives. We still have lots and lots of progressives and everything in between. And most folks I meet are somewhere in between. Uh, trying to understand how can we be a loving community and how does God look at this. And, and we want to continue to say that when it comes to sexuality, we're meant to practice holiness. We're meant to practice agape. We're meant to practice love. And what I love in the scripture when it comes to how Jesus looked at people who struggled with uh, sexuality or who violated the, the rules. Um, so now I'm thinking of people who clearly violated things that I would consider wrong and you would consider wrong, the Bible considers wrong. So I think about one of my favorites is in John chapter 4. And the woman who the woman who is at the at the well, and Jesus meets the woman at Jacob's well. She's been married and divorced five times, and now she's living with a man who's not her husband. So she's living with a man. Um, she's been divorced multiple times, and Jesus doesn't you know he doesn't favor divorce for reasons I talked about some uh, some weeks ago. Although I think again there are times and situations where God understands that this is not a, a marriage that's healthy anymore. But for uh, for Jesus, he looks at this woman. He makes clear that he knows that she's living with a man and she's been married and divorced time, five times. And then he offers her living water by which she'll never thirst again. And then she goes to be the first evangelist. He, he reveals to her that he's the Messiah. So she's the first person that he directly says that to, if I remember in the Gospel of John. And then he, she goes to be the first evangelist to the Samaritan people. I love that, that this was a woman that, that the synagogue in that community, or the, you know, she was a Samaritan, so whatever their synagogue was, probably rejected but Jesus didn't reject her and he didn't lecture her about living together with this man he just offered her living water and loved her which I think is amazing Luke chapter 7 a prostitute who weeps at Jesus feet and Jesus shows mercy to her Luke or John chapter 8 the adulteress who's the woman is caught in the act of adultery and the and the religious leaders come to stone her to death and Jesus shows mercy to uh, this woman I mean 
that paints a picture of what Jesus is like towards those who have sinned sexually, which represents, I'm pretty much sure, 99.9% .9 of the rest of you. And, uh, and then there's the question again, how does he look at gay and lesbian people? And I'm just sharing with you how I see them in our congregation as dearly loved children of God and, and for whom God would also uh, wish them to share uh, their life with a companion. And so, anyway, uh, that's a little bit of my take on how, where we're coming out at General Conference is we're going to, I hope, lift those, uh, those policies out. We are going to be a church that continues to hold people to the highest standards. We want people to be holy and for sexuality to be used in a way that expresses agape in the context of a covenant relationship. And then there's lots of grace when we blow it, which almost everybody does somewhere along the way. All right, so last thing I'll mention is the revised social principles. Our first social creed was in 1908. Actually, I'm preaching on this this weekend, so I hope you'll just turn into the sermon, uh, tune into the sermon. But our first social creed was from uh, 1908, long before we had a social creed. Uh, the United, the Methodist Church, um, going all the way back to Wesley, was engaged in the brokenness in the world and trying to heal a broken world. That's my sermon this weekend. Is, is a church that attracts people who are non-religious and nominally religious who have turned away from God and church is a church that seeks to heal a broken world. And Wesley and the early Methodists sought to do that. And the Methodists at the turn of the century and the 20th century sought to do that. So in 1908, in our Book of Discipline, we included a social creed. That social creed has been modified along the way. And I, I thought I'd just read to you what the social creed is today. So creeds are statements of faith, and the Methodist Church became the first denomination that I know of that had a social creed that we approved. This is the current social creed. We believe in God, creator of the world, and in Jesus Christ, the redeemer of creation. We believe in the Holy Spirit through whom we acknowledge God's gifts, and we repent of our sin and misusing these gifts to idolatrous ends. We affirm the natural world as God's handiwork and dedicate ourselves to its preservation, enhancement, and faithful use by humankind. We joyfully receive, ourselves, receive for ourselves and others the blessings of community, sexuality, marriage, and the family. We commit ourselves to the rights of men, women, children, youth, young adults, the aging, and people with disabilities to improve the quality of life and to the rights and dignity of all persons. We believe in the right and duty of persons to work for the glory of God and the, power, and the good of themselves and others and in the protection of their welfare in so doing, in the rights to property as a trust from God, collective bargaining, and responsible consumption, and in the elimination of economic and social distress. We dedicate ourselves to peace through the world, to the rule of justice and law among nations, and to individual freedom for all people of the world. We believe in the present and final triumph of God's word in human affairs, and gladly accept our commission to manifest the life of the gospel in the world. Amen. So that's our social creed today. And then we have a set of social principles in our book of discipline. They are non-binding, and uh, when you read them, there are certain of the social principles. I would say a different way. I, I would nuance them a little bit. I'd say them differently, but, you know, I didn't get, get to write them. And when you bring people together to write the social principles, you're going to have tweaks here and there. But by and large, I agree with the social principles, and I'm grateful that the United Methodist Church is a church that says we should be engaged in the world. And where there's pain in the world, God feels pain. And we should be addressing that and trying to work for justice, to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. And so our social principles are, have been rewritten. There was 5,000 people who were working on these social principles over the last, I think 5,000, 4,000 some from around the world over the last, I think it was five years. And uh, they have developed a new set of social principles. So we've rewritten the social principles. They're largely, there's a lot of what was in there before, mostly the same things. We have lifted out the things that were prohibitive about gay and lesbian people. And there are some other things we've added. There were things that weren't even around when the social principles were first developed in 1972, I think it was. And so, you know, digital things, uh, things related to the digital world. And so we've added some of those things in there. And I would love for you to review the new social principles. Uh, I'm hoping that they'll be approved at General Conference. So removing the language, the revised social principles. And right after this, I'm going to post the link so that you can go and read the revised social principles. It's not law. You don't have to agree with everything in there. But, it, but even if I disagree, I'm grateful that we are asking the questions and inviting our people to ask, how do we live out our faith when it comes to the environment? How do we live out our faith when it comes to health care, when it comes to poverty, when it comes to the digital age? And, uh, and so I'm going to post the link to that. It'll be in five minutes. I'll post that link and on my Facebook page. So anyway, and then the last thing is to look at a regionalization plan where we change how our structure works so that there are regions that get to adapt the Book of Discipline 
including the U.S., gets to adapt the Book of Discipline for our region. And, uh, and that's something that will also be talked about at General Conference. Okay, that's way more than you wanted. It's, I'm sorry I went uh, just over an hour, uh, but I hope th hopefully this was helpful to you. Join me next Tuesday night at Facebook Vespers, and I'm going to join you from General Conference, give you an update. I'll join you the next Tuesday night from General Conference, where things will really be getting exciting and heating up. And um, once more, I just want to say I love this church. Uh, not like I love Jesus, but I am grateful for the United Methodist Church. I'm proud of it. I want to see it be its best. And I'd love to see us get to a place where we're no longer fighting every four years, but instead we're asking the same question. Conservatives and progressives and centrists asking, what is God calling our church to be and do today? And not spending all of our time fighting over things that we disagree about, but instead looking at how we can agree to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world today. All right, let's pray together. And I'd like to invite you to bow with me if you would. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your love and grace. Thank you for everything. Thank you for the wind that's blowing outside that maybe others can hear on my Facebook feed. That reminds me of your Holy Spirit rushing through the upper room. We pray that you would, at General Conference in Charlotte, that it would be like an upper room, and that your Holy Spirit would blow through that place and through the hearts and the minds of every person who's a delegate there, that you would help us to do your will as a church. Help us to move this church forward so that we can be an instrument of your healing in this world. God, please help us. Help us, O oh Lord to be the church you want us to be. Help us to hear your voice. Guide us, we pray. Bless all of these who are joining me here, and we offer our lives to you. We love you and praise you. Now hear us as we pray together the prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, if this was helpful to you, would you just share it with your friends? Just say, hey, you might want to check this out. It'll be posted on YouTube, but it'll also be here on my Facebook page. And just have them tune in and watch it if you think it might be helpful. God bless you all. Please be praying for us at General Conference. I look forward to seeing you in church this weekend. I'm super excited about this weekend's message and looking forward to sharing it with you. And it's Confirmation Weekend at Resurrection. I think we got about 200 and, I don't know, 226 confirmands being confirmed this weekend. I'm pretty excited about that too. God bless you and have a great night.